Uh, oh man, I hope so. <laughs> Open your hymnal to number 662. This is the heart longs, H A R T, a deer longs for flowing streams. 662. 662. And the tune is uh, an Appalachian folk tune. Go. Like that, okay? Huh? assuming too much but I will project better for you Lord willing and you know it's really simple to do this I actually know what that means eh we'll read the first eight verses of Psalm 63 Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah oh God you are my God I shall seek you earnestly my soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Let's just finish the psalm. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes, but the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouth of those who speak lies will be stopped. Thus far, God's holy word. Perhaps you remember a film, the public broadcasting did a few years ago called Secret Garden, based upon a, a book by that name. It's, Wonderful children's story, but it's great for adults. 
Uh, the basic theme of the story is that these three children, kind of a bit dysfunctional, uh, discover on, in the manor place a walled-in garden that had just been locked up. Uh, they broke into it, fell in love with it, and the three of them began to bring it back. And so this was their secret garden, but what happens in the secret garden is their lives are transformed uh, by what they did together in that garden. Now, it's interesting that uh, Solomon, in the Song of Solomon, speaks of the fellowship that God has with his people as God's walled garden. And our communion with God may be compared then to uh, a secret garden. Now, we've talked about that communion that takes place in corporate worship, and that is the most important and transformative communion uh, places and experiences that we have with God. But that does not exhaust our communion with God and what God does for us in our lives. There is the secret element, and we can couple with that the family element of worship that actually will undergird the other and be fed by the other, but is also a very important part of our spiritual uh, pursuit, the disciplines of grace. And so I want us to think this morning about our private worship, how we commune with God. And the text of these first eight verses, particularly verses one through six of Psalm uh, 63, uh, we read of this Psalm that it's when David um, fled and was in the wilderness of Judah. And some commentators will take this when he uh, was pursued by Saul, but because he is already king and because of the function of the tabernacle in Jerusalem, uh, I think this took place when he fled Absalom. So he went out of Jerusalem northwest toward the Jordan. If you look at a Bible map, there's then a desert area between Jerusalem and the river. And I think that it's as he was in this area or reflecting on his experience in this area uh, that he uh, penned these words. And they are the words of a man who's been cut off from public ordinances and is heartbroken because of that. What he then discovers uh, in private communion. And so we simply want to see here that the Christian uh, may uh, commune with God in private worship. And we'll consider two things. The Christian places great value on communion with God, and the Christian may experience this communion with God in private worship. Well, first then, the value that we should be placing on communion uh, with God. I trust that you've got a greater sense of that already in the things that we have looked at. But notice here David's uh, longing. You are, O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. As David flees uh, from Absalom in Jerusalem, he comes into this desert area. Uh, the very place he is is uh, reflective of his soul. He's in a desert. You all know all about deserts, a dry and parched desert. And just as the body uh, yearns for water in the desert, this arid, monochromatic, ash environment uh, was reflective of a soul that had become arid and monochromatic and ash-filled. And he is crying out with this intensity of a soul thirst for God, a flesh yearning for God. A few years ago, perhaps you read the story of the young man who decided to walk across America and in the process was converted. Uh, it's a great story, but he tells about it when he gets here to um, New Mexico, Arizona area, and he's out there in the barren land and he is just, I mean, almost literally dying of thirst. And he comes up on an irrigation ditch. And he just bends over and scoops up the water. He's not thinking about 
pollutants or mud or anything else. He was that thirsty. Now that's the soul thirst that David is expressing here for God. <laughs> Have you ever yearned for God in that way? Uh, I guess when we're in deep trouble, sometimes we do, but uh, to yearn for God with the entirety of our being, uh, like a man dying of thirst, the body aching uh, for God. I remember one time when I would, had gone over to uh, England and it was a disastrous day. I would got in the car at the airport and I was driving uh, through London. Sinclair Ferguson told me, Joey, I never drive in London. Um, but anyway, I'm driving up to Cambridge where I was going to spend a week studying. And they, they use these, um, for construction, they've got these 12 by 12s. And uh, a truck is coming at me, of course, on the wrong side of the road. And I probably overcompensated. And so I hit my tire on that thing, and it went flat. There was no spare in this rental car. I call and wait on them. It is hours later when I get to Cambridge, and um, I am so homesick. I ached for my wife and my children and my home. Uh, and I just wish I ached that way for God, to be homesick, to be yearning for him. Well, that's, this is, that's the intensity that David's expressing. And this is how... Um, we should value the communion with God because he gives the reason then in verse 2, thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Now, as I mentioned last hour, uh, David is reflecting here on the glories of corporate worship. Remember, as he was leaving Jerusalem and the priests bring the ark to go with him, and David says, no, the ark is going to remain in the tabernacle. He wasn't going to be like the early Israelites and use it as a fetish or a good luck charm. It remains here. And so in a sense, he's exiling himself from this symbol of the presence of God and of corporate worship. And he's in this desert place and he's cut off now. He doesn't know for how long he'll be cut off from enjoying God in uh, the corporate assembly in the temple with the singing of the priest and all the things that are going on because there he beheld the glory of God as the psalms were sung and the sacrifices were being made and the ritual and the prayers were being observed um, God's presence was there both his power his saving power his redeeming power his creating power and his glory the manifestation of the beauty of God. And David, well, he, he's cut off from the privileges of corporate worship. And he's so sick, smitten, stricken by uh, this experience. Maybe this anticipates as well the experience of our Savior on the cross. As he is truly derelict cut off not just from corporate worship, but from the very presence in this mystery, the very presence of his Father as he satisfies his wrath. And what does he say? I thirst. He truly yearned for God. He was cut off for us that we might never be cut off from the presence of God, even if we are cut off from uh, corporate worship. And so the Spirit is showing us here the great value of communing with God, particularly, as we noted last hour, the value of communing with God in corporate worship. And I've already anticipated this some, but uh, do you enjoy communing with God? We struggled a bit last night with what that means to delight in God, to enjoy His presence. We expanded a bit on that this morning. Is that something that is a part of your Christian experience? Do you understand the difference between knowing about God and being with God? Thinking of some of those biblical things, uh, to walk before me, to walk with him, to know that the Father and the Son have come to us and commune with us. Is this part of your Christian experience 
that you enjoy communion with God? And do you mourn the fact when either because of some sin on your part or because God sovereignly simply withholds himself for periods of time from you, are you sensible of his absence? Or are you so callous spiritually that you, you don't know when he's absent? As I said last night, we can go through all the motions, can't we? We can do all the right things and, and not realize that we're not communing with God. But see, we're to value this communion uh, with God. We, we can't create it. We got to plead for the Holy Spirit to give it to us. Now, I know that Christ has purchased it for us. It's part of our inheritance. So we just need to become conscious of the want, which in itself will become the longing, won't it? So if you're conscious of the want, then the longing has begun. And you're asking Christ by his Spirit now to give you more. But I ask you also, are you as concerned about being cut off from public worship? Is public worship something that you can take it or leave it? And so, yes, uh, it's nice when we have it, but um, you go off on vacation and you don't really do the work of trying to find a place to worship or to pay the sacrifice, or you've got company drop in and uh, your kids are there and he says, well, you know, I just um, think I'll stay home this morning. Or when you're compelled to miss it because of illness, either someone you're tending to or, or your own illness. Is there, any, is there any longing in you? Or is it just the Lord's Day just the same? Well, it had been nice to be there, but are you really missing corporate worship in the way that David expresses here? In this psalm. I think this is to be the normal Christian experience. And I think that because just because we fall so beneath it, we should not define normality by our experience, but normality by the pattern that's set for us in Scripture. Just think of the psalmist. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than to sit at the king's of table. Oh, taste and see that God is good. And may he enable us to have this esteem for corporate worship, to enjoy it in the ways that we talked about last hour, and to grow in our realization of delightful communion and fellowship with God. So the Christian values communion with God, values the presence of God, values corporate worship. But the second thing then the Spirit shows us here is the Christian can experience and should experience this communion in private worship. Now this was the surprise, so to speak, of, of David's life. And perhaps he actually is collating the earlier experience as well when he was cut off. Um, because he, he then wrote, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. What a reversal. In verse 1, he says, My, thirst, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you, in a dry and weary land where there's no water. And now he says, I am satiated like a man at a feast. My soul that longed for God is satiated as with marrow and fatness, all the richness of a huge banquet table. What happened? Well, he tells us what happened. That uh, in the wilderness, he discovered that he could enjoy the presence of God and communion with God as he sought him. And so he tells us in verse 8, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate you on you in the night watches. For you've been my help in the shadow of your wings. And perhaps this is actually a, a reference again. So at the tabernacle, it's the shadow of the wings of God, the wings of the cherubim. But now he's experiencing the shadow of God's wings in the desert. And his soul is clinging to God who is upholding him. 
So what David discovered and what the Spirit wants you and me to discover here is that in communion with God in private, we can experience His presence in a glorious manner, uh, in a way that makes our souls fat and causes us to leap with joy and to praise God. Now, he says that he's remembering on the bed and meditating in the night watches. And so he's fled. He's trying to sleep. He actually talks in Psalm 3 and 4 about the fact he could sleep even as he, as he fled uh, Absalom. But also as he would awaken in the night watches, he began to meditate. And it was in the practice of meditation, practicing the presence of God, so to speak, in private that he came into the soul fatness. And notice how he meditates. We go back now to the first part of verse 1. He reminded himself that God was his covenant God. Oh God, that is Elohim, you are my God. That didn't change, you see. Whether you're in good circumstances or bad circumstances, whether you're with God's people or you're cut off, uh, you're not cut off from God. That's Paul's great exclamation at the end of, of Romans 8. That even in God's providence, he says, he quotes the psalm, that uh, we are as sheep being slaughtered. Uh, we expect tribulation and trial. It's through that that we enter into heaven because tribulation works patience and patience proven character and proven character hope. It, it, God's testing us and God's sanctifying us. And so... Um, we uh, know then, he says, that but God will never forsake us. For I'm persuaded neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor death nor any other creature can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And so, friends, dwell on the reality that you are in covenant with God. We don't make nearly enough of, of the covenant. Our whole confession is arranged on this pattern of, of the covenant. And the, the glorious reality is that because the Lord Jesus Christ is our covenant head and mediator and surety, that we are in covenant with God. Our sins have been completely pardoned, but we have been constituted legally righteous. We're now the adopted children of God, and the Spirit of Christ is indwelling us and is transforming us into the image of God. And we ought to, with great joy, be able to address him, O oh God, my God. And as you're mindful of God as your covenant God, and all that he is as your covenant God, always given himself to you as your covenant God, that is the beginning of communing with him. And then we've mentioned the use, then, of the other names of God. And then notice that he's reflecting on God's attributes, just as we talked about that in connection with private worship. So as he saw power and glory in the sanctuary, he says, now, because of your loving kindness is better than life. He is reflecting now on the attributes of God, and this covenant God has covenant love. And so he's thinking about the power of God and the protection of God and the mercy and love of the covenant God who does not change, whose right hand uh, upholds us. So you see what's happening here to David is that uh, as he's praying, as he's earnestly longing for God, the Spirit moves him to begin to think on God and become so thankful that this is his God and it's in God's <coughs> providence that he is where he is and thus God is with him God's led him there and will care for him there and so the result of David's experience is um, because your loving kindness is better than life my lips will praise you I will bless you now he's worshiping in the wilderness, with his lips, his whole body, my lips, my lips will praise you. I lift my hands in your name. And that's, again, the name of God. All that God is 
has surrounded David in his meditations so that name and titles and attributes and works and in response he's lifting his hands uh, in, in praise uh, to God and his mouth is uh, with joyful lips is offering this praise uh, to God. So with his entire being that just a bit before was famished with yearning and longing, now his entire being satiated with the feast of God's presence is worshiping God. And this is taking place in private worship, on his bed, in his tent, apart from the people of God. He experiences the help of God, the shadow of the wings of God, and he's clinging to God because God is taking hold of him. So it's a simple but glorious lesson that the Spirit lays out for us here. And this is what you and I then are to be seeking in our private worship and by extension in family worship, that we may commune with God. So I want to give you some practical helps. Most of you probably know all of these things well, and I trust you practice them, but it won't hurt to review. This private worship begins with a settled time, place, and method. That sounds so simple, but it never happens haphazardly. You can have good intentions. I'm going to have my private worship. And how many times do those good intentions fall to the wayside? Well, there are practical things that you can do to create, in the proper sense, a biblical habit. It's every bit a part of your life as brushing your teeth is physically. And time, place, and method is the beginning. And so you have uh, a set time in your schedule, and you organize your life around, this is the time of day when I'm going to have my private time with the Lord. And you've got a place so that when you go there, you, your wife, your children know this is my place, this is my closet, so to speak, where I'm pulling aside to be with Christ alone. And again, we become so ignorant of these things. Places, environment, dress, all play a role in our performance. So that's another reason why how we dress for different activities. I've always been a fan of, of uh, uniforms at school. Even for a while, my daughter-in-law had her kids in a uniform. I think it's great uh, because there are reinforcements that take place. We see this in the workforce. When uh, businesses went to casual Friday, you know what happened on Friday? Productivity fell way off. Well, that was Friday. Well, no, it was Friday the week before. <laughs> it had always been Friday. It had always been anticipation, uh, but it fell off from that. And so, and, and places are important. I try to teach my students, you know, lying in bed. Yes, Calvin was an ill man, and so he, uh, he would study in bed. Churchill did great work in bed, but these were geniuses. These aren't pygmies like us. Place where we do things is very important. It's good to pray on the treadmill or walking on the street, but our Savior says, go into your closet. To be a stated formal time and place. And a place that's dedicated to that. It can be dedicated to things later, but it's dedicated to that when you're in there. And then method. Don't go in there and say, what am I going to read today? And I'll read this or I'll read that. Uh, no. Get a program uh, with which you're going to work whether it is a study book, whether it's using a Bible reading calendar, which I think uh, you all should do regardless what else you do. I use McShane, and in God's grace, one year in my entire life since seminary and I started using McShane, I didn't use it, and it just was not a happy year. So I use McShane, read through the Bible, Old Testament once a year, New Testament and Psalms uh, twice a year, until I started doing the Psalms in Hebrew, so I read the Psalms more slowly now, just through in that way. But you see now, I've been doing this for 47 years. I actually had a dream last night about, I was somewhere, 
I think you were there, and somebody was giving Bible quizzes, and I was just, I wasn't supposed to be doing it, you were. Or her, I think it was you, but I'm not sure, but anyway. <laughs> but I was answering all these questions that I, I wasn't, you know, we were talking about not being prepared for exams or anything. And I said, it's because I read the Bible. And uh, so, but some method is very important, and if you don't have one, then get with your pastor and uh, get a method of book. My <coughs> wife loves to use Matthew Henry in connection with her reading, and you can do no better uh, than Matthew Henry. And you can also get him electronically now as well, and so she's actually got him on her tablet, and she's got her Bible, and she's reading uh, Matthew Henry. But time, place, and method. If you're going to learn to commune with God in private, the very simple, practical steps that you should observe. Next, you come seeking the Spirit's grace to enable you to pray, worship, and to learn. And in the larger catechism exposition of the Lord's Prayer, how doth the Spirit help us to pray? We not knowing what to pray for as we ought, the Spirit helps our infirmities by enabling us to understand both for whom and what and how prayers be made. So the for whom and what, but the how prayers be made. And by working and quickening in our hearts, although not in all persons nor at all times in the same measure, those apprehensions, affections, and graces which are requisite for the right performance of that duty. Now the caution is we don't depend upon our feelings and the spirit is sovereign in his work. What we're asking him for is right apprehensions of God and what we're doing and right affections and right graces. These are things that we're talking about, you see, and we get them from the spirit. And so as we approach God then in a private worship, and all this is true for family worship as well, even the time, place, and, and method, as we approach God then in private worship, we do so in a conscious dependence upon the Holy Spirit to stir up our hearts and to enable us to commune with God and to teach us. Then, and this is so important, this is where I've often failed. I mentioned last night, we often rush into it and through it. And that you know, is the, the danger you have to watch out for if you use a method. I gotta get through my chapters today. Uh, and that's a sin, that w a temptation that we have to guard against that doesn't become a sin. Uh, and so, to borrow words from a, a song of my youth, slow down, you move too fast, you got to make the moment to change in the words last. So, the next stage is to begin to gaze on the lovingness of God until you, the Spirit does begin to quicken your affections and your apprehensions. Now, I promised you last hour that I was gonna give you a resource for doing this. And I have just I've fallen in love with the first two chapters of, uh, the first chapter, all three paragraphs, second chapter, all three paragraphs of the Confession of Faith of God and the Holy Trinity. And so you can just take this, and of course, the, the great summary that you can easily memorize that what is a God? God, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That's expanded a bit more in the larger catechism. Um, give you that number as well. So that's, uh, I don't have my harmony here. Anyway, early on in both of them, what is God? Um, it's seven in the larger catechism. God is a spirit in and of himself, infinite, we get that independence, self-sufficiency, in and of himself, infinite in being, glory, blessedness, perfection, all sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful. So when it takes these attributes that we can actually, as God's image bearers, reflect some of them, he has them most. <laughs> we have them relatively uh, small, most merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant, in goodness and in truth. And then the Shorter Catechism is um, four or five. Yeah, four. That's the one that I trust we all have memorized. But all this is expanded in uh, chapter two of God and the Holy Trinity. And so I'm not gonna take time to read it because you can read 
It's all in the back of your... Well, I hope that every family here has the confession and the large and short of catechism in your home. A, B, that it's an essential part of your religious practice. So a few years ago, I prepared a reader uh, so that you can read through the confession and both catechisms yearly. And then a good friend of mine, Tim Hopper, a, a, a brilliant computer guy that's a deacon over at an OP church in Raleigh, uh, put it in a, a, a subscription form. So you can actually get the uh, text for the day on your phone. It's there for me at 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, so I don't have to keep up with it. I just trust it to come on time. Uh, but see, that's great as well. And you incorporate that into your thinking, your living, and your reading. But particularly make this chapter a manual for meditation, okay? And just begin to work your way through it. Pray through these attributes. Take a few until your heart begins to be quickened with love for God. And it's the great way to enter into his presence. Then begin your reading and studying. And as you do so, you might be one of those people that takes notes. Uh, my wife used to take notes of my preaching in her Bible, but now she just takes notes out of Matthew Henry. I've been supplanted, but I can think of no better place to be supplanted than by Matthew Henry. So uh, but if, you, if, you if you're a note taker, take notes. Maybe keep a catalog of different things that you're learning about God in connection with a, a prayer journal. Um, and then interact with what you're reading in prayer. So if you're convicted, confess sin, you see the need uh, of God's work, ask for his favor, uh, and through your reading you'll be praying for all kinds of things personally in the church and in, in the larger, uh, larger world. Uh, and uh, in connection with that, then confessing your own sin, um, looking for heartfelt repentance and confession of sin, and then um, uh, praying uh, petitions for yourself and for others. I love the way Paul puts it in Colossians chapter 4, uh, as well praying for me. So he's assuming you pray for all this other stuff that we are to pray for, but particularly for the coming of the kingdom as we're instructed in the Lord's Prayer and the advance of the gospel in our midst and unto the ends of the earth. So these are simple things, but if you do these in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, you're going to enjoy what David enjoyed in the wilderness, in the comfort of a comfortable home. So you've got that advantage over David. And of course, um, this then will make our corporate worship so much sweeter and uh, edifying and a means of real communion with God. So Christian, practice and enjoy communion with God in private worship. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you for what you give us here uh, in this great lesson that we can commune with you and be satisfied with you, even cut off, Lord, uh, from uh, the corporate assembly. And that even though uh, your presence is special there, it is with us, even in private. And we thank you. We thank you for the great resource you've given us in our Westminster Confession, Lord. Particularly this great exposition of who you are. And may we make good practical use of this as well. In preparation for corporate worship and in coming uh, before you, Lord, in private worship. In Christ's name, amen. So I, I failed to mention, use the same procedure then as you're preparing on the Lord's Day morning. Just take one or two of these attributes. So we do some questions? I can just repeat them for the, you can carry the mic around or I can repeat them for the, whichever. All right, kick it around. So if you have a question, I'll bring it up. If I can't answer it, Pastor will. That's right. I'm, I, I make stuff up better than he does. So, um, Mike. I think Mrs. Gillespie had a question. And then well, Mrs. Have, Fernandez. I had some problems with some of what you said about uh, coming to corporate worship. Um, 
I kind of thought you were saying if we don't do it properly, we're committing the worst sin? No, uh, what I intended to say was if we don't do it, uh, I was talking to unbelievers. Yes, yeah. If they don't do that, that's the worst sin. If they don't believers, worship God. Believers who are not attending church. No, I, I was talking to unbelievers. Okay, unbelievers, well. That's who I was addressing at that point. Those outside of Christ, I was probably not clear. Okay. So that, what I'm saying is for an unbeliever, um, and particularly those that make lists of how good they are, the worst sin they can commit is a refusal to honor God, which means coming to him through Christ mm -hmm. and then honor and glorify him in all of life and in corporate worship. For the believer, it's a terrible sin. It's a violation of the first four commandments. Mm -hmm. And so it is a terrible sin. It's not the worst sin uh, that a believer can commit, but it's, it's a very serious sin for a believer to neglect public worship. Thank you. And you would agree with that? Yes, I'm sorry. I was, I, thank you for asking that. You're cheating. <laughs> a cat, that's right. <laughs> I have a little trouble hearing sometimes. Could you elaborate perhaps a little bit more on what you said about praying for the second coming? If, if you did indeed say something about I that. I didn't. I said that we should anticipate the second coming. I don't think I talked about praying for the second coming, but that we should. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. The kingdom to come. That means Christ is advancing by the growing the church and overthrowing false religion. Thank you. That's what we're praying for. Yes. And actually, the confession talks about the kingdom of grace of the catechism and the kingdom of glory. So I was talking about the kingdom of grace, that we are praying for the uh, conversion, the gathering and perfecting of the elect through the work of the church, here and under the ends of the earth, the overthrow of false religion. Would you then, uh, I'll ask it in a, a different way, would you give, us, give me at least your thought on praying for the second coming? I think we should pray that Christ would come um, because that we would come and, and deliver and perfect his church. Um, I think that I think that prayer in Revelation, though, is for Christ's coming in judgment on the persecutors of the church, not primarily on the uh, on the second coming. Now, that's a it's a continuum. Even when we look at these passages that are speaking primarily the destruction of Jerusalem, or I take Revelation to be the overthrow of, of the false prophet and of the, of the Roman Empire, uh, but there's still the principles there. that We're praying that God will vindicate his church in every age, and of course that final vindication of the church will be the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we should... Uh, uh, long for and pray for, knowing that that will be then the uh, end of the uh, dishonoring of Christ and the suffering of the church. So, um, in the end of the exposition of, of Larger Catechism 199, we're praying then for this, hasten the time of his second coming and our reigning with him forever that he would be pleased to exercise the kingdom of his power in all the world as may best conduce to those ends. And so that he would hasten his coming and that he now would exercise his power in a way unto the end of his coming back and making his bride perfect. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for asking that. Your wife, I've, been, I've promised her. interpretation of both of your parts. <laughs> Maybe on his. <laughs> um, back to corporate worship. And I'm not sure how to articulate it. You're not? If we're coming with joy, with gladness, with, I'm not sure what other adjectives. Joyful shouting. That's the how, amen, by the way. How do we not fall prey to the temptation to judge worship or by 
the excitement that it produces in us or in the congregation or want to have that, to have it be like a pep rally? How do you have appropriate emotion as a result instead of a Okay, design? that's good. Uh, Psalm 2 concludes, um, uh, worship with fear, rejoice with trembling. So we should do nothing in worship that gets in the way of reverence. That's uh, a key factor. I, I mentioned this morning Deuteronomy 6, 13 and 10, 20. It is we are to uh, worship and serve him with reverence. Actually, it's we are to reverence him and to serve him. And so worship is always be marched with, with, with reverence, with, with the dignity, um, and with joy. Now, it's the joy that's often missing, but it's not because we're not doing things uh, structurally as much as uh, we are um, not coming ourselves joyful. So, but there are, as, as you know, I think that there are postures that contribute to a whole person worship. And they will help us to worship as people and not as separate individuals as well. And that's why, for example, shout joyfully, the corporate amen shouted uh, is uh, something in scripture. Uh, Jerome talked about one service that he heard, I think in Bethlehem, where it was like a, a peal of thunder rolling across the congregation. Or at, after our psalms and hymns, uh, the shouted amen, uh, giving our acclamation to, to those things. So uh, there are things, there, there's some things that we do in that way structurally, but it really begins with our hearts. But we're not developing uh, tricks and gimmicks to stir up our emotions. So we're not introducing strange instruments into the service to, because they're going to create uh, more enthusiasm. A musical instrument is purely to help us sing. And that's its only purpose, in my opinion. It shouldn't be used for offertories or communion or anything else. After the call to worship, before the benediction, in my opinion, it should only be used to help us sing and to do that well, but uh, not ostentatiously. Does that help? I didn't say that. I do think that we can know when there's not been much. Um, well, you talked about some of the services you've been in. You made judgments, and they were probably valid judgments. Um, if you know, you can make a judgment if a congregation is not singing well. Uh, that's an objective judgment. And either it's because an organ is playing so loud you can't hear them singing, or they're not singing one way or the other. I don't care for organs in corporate worship either. But, uh, <laughs> they're just not good instruments to help us sing. I love organs. Yeah. So a piano in our culture is the best instrument to help us sing. And then the pianist then helps us sing. So it's not really giving us tone, pitch, rhythm. But an accomplished accompanist can also help us sing, and that's good. But congregational singing, you can, you can tell a lot about people. You can watch. If uh, particularly men are not singing, that really tells you something about those men in corporate worship. Um, why don't they want to sing? So there are, are those types of things. Are, are, if preaching is dull and boring, there's never an excuse, no, for preaching to be dull and boring. Um, that's an objective, objective thing. If, and so there are all those types of things. That, um, is there um, a spirituality in the worship that uh, is directing our attention to God and to his beauty and glory and greatness? We make objective considerations about the liturgy itself. How is it put together? Is this designed to bring me into God's presence? Uh, is it designed for men? So there's, yeah, lots of things that... I've been uh, uh, trying to read uh, a book 
by a man named James K. Smith. Uh, and he talks uh, in his book, Awaiting the King, he used the word liturgy a lot in there. And he sees it uh, everywhere. And I guess he's talking not just about the work, but uh, as a form of the work that we do. Yeah. And uh, so he talks about uh, the liturgy actually uh, uh, shaping or, or training us one way or another. Uh, and perhaps you were getting at that with your, your short reference to the, the edification uh, in your corporate worship talk. I just wondered if you could expand on uh, liturgy mm. uh, forming us either in a positive direction or potentially in a negative direction. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. It's something I'm very keen, uh, keen on um, because it does, uh, as it directs our attention to God, there's a, a didactic element that's taking place uh, in liturgy if it's done properly. Uh, so we begin with God, and I actually uh, use the old Dutch form that goes from call to worship, where God commands us into his presence. We come taking the vow that I'm beginning to try to get people to do actually responsively, but the, it's from uh, Psalm uh, of Ascension. My help is in the name of the Lord who made heavens and earth. I think that's what Calvin used and it's in the Westminster Directory of Worship. And then God greets us with one of the apostolic greetings, um, grace and mercy from the Lord God, from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So God has summoned us. We have come to his presence with this commitment, and he greets us. So immediately we've unfolded uh, the covenantal nature of worship and the pleasure that God has in worship. And then we'll respond to him with a hymn of adoration that would focus on him perhaps in his Trinitarian being as well, or maybe an attribute that is going to be connected with the sermon preached later in the service, and with a prayer of adoration and invocation, which I said last night or this morning, whenever I said it, uh, is often, you know, this morning, often omitted. Uh, and then since we're in the presence of a holy God, uh, here is the time to read the law of God. And then we respond with confession of sin, assurance of pardon, and thanksgiving, and the reading of scripture, and the directory of worship reminds, in the Westminster directory, that the reading of scripture is in itself an act of worship. They recommended Old and New Testament readings. Some churches do that consecutively. I encourage in more mature congregations like yours to do the biblical theological reading. So if I'm preaching through a New Testament text, I'm gonna read much more than the text. I'm gonna read a good portion of scripture. I'm also gonna read a parallel passage in Old Testament and vice versa. And then, of course, the Psalms and the hymns. Now, a number of things are happening here. So the, the dialogue is going, God's attributes are exalted, but you also have law and gospel. <laughs> so you've read the law, you've confessed sin, you've held forth Christ, you've announced assurance of pardon. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that people are being shaped in their thought of God by the liturgy. So I think it is, and then the very words of our prayers, and which also I like, Calvin used both common prayer and free prayer. And I like to use the great prayers of confession um, from the history of the church. We're praying uh, with the church. But free prayer is also a very important part. And a minister must develop his gift of praying. Um, and um, the creeds, we cut ourselves off from our history. Uh, it's, it's very interesting that the, um, there's two things. One's in the, in the catechism. And I'm, uh, I, I was negligent with, about this and have really changed uh, on this, but it's interesting uh, in the question, um, how is the Lord's Prayer to be used, 187? The Lord's Prayer is not only for direction as a pattern, according to which we're to make our other prayers. So it is that, it's a blueprint, but may also be used as a prayer 
so that it be done with understanding, faith, reverence, and other graces necessary to the right performance of the duty of prayer. And then uh, under, I forget where it is, maybe it's at the end of the Shorter Catechism, they, there's a footnote in the old uh, Scottish edition that uh, says something to the effect that um, the Apostles' Creed, the Presbyterians wanted to get it, uh, as you know, it's, it's a pattern in the Heidelberg, uh, but the independents kept, kept it out. But when the Scottish Assembly adopted uh, the directory uh, for worship, they added the footnote uh, that this is a proper uh, creed along with the Nicene Creed and others to be used. So obviously they instruct us as well, instruct us of our connectedness. We are part of the Holy Catholic Church and the great truths of, uh, of God and redemption. So yeah, I think there's a lot of um, genuine teaching that goes on, good or bad, it's what we genuine teaching, good or bad, that goes on in how we worship. You know, Calvin said that if you ask us what are the two most essential things to our existence and how a person may be right with God, you would think he first would have said the method of salvation. He said, first, the way in which God should be worshiped. Second, the method of our salvation. Another place he says you cannot have a proper view of being right with God without a proper view of worship. So you understand that in our denomination, we are in desperate times. We are uh, basically, with our Sabbath breaking and our bad worship, are destroying our churches and our families. So they can, it's like Keynesian economics. It can be a, an appearance of prosperity, but it is destructive in my dogmatic opinion. Very other, good. Other questions? Okay. Well, we have lunch for you. I know you had something to eat before, but because I'm a fat person, I only think about food first. So uh, we'll, we'll pray here and then go over there. Uh, Cindy's getting the food out. Let her get over there, and, uh, and then uh, we can go on over. Uh, and then uh, we're done for the day. And uh, we're, Lord willing, we'll be gathering t uh, tomorrow morning at, at 9. <clears throat> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's us. We write 9 down. People show up about 9.15. We get to start about 9.20, maybe. And uh, we have, what, a 10-minute uh, Sunday school service time. But that's just us. Um, so... Minute 11, and then in the evening, if you can come back, uh, we'll meet at 6, and we'll have some snacky dinner time, and then uh, Joy will talk to us about uh, the direction of our denomination, and we can ask questions of what's been going on and, and what's what's happening now. All right, well. Yes. Seminary, get it, read it, pray for us. Yes. Yeah. 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 Your church does, and it's wonderful. Yes, we're glad to support the seminary. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we worship your name and give you thanks because you have encouraged our hearts in your word. We want to be like the longing heart, panting for who you are, desiring you above all else. Thank you that you've given us a, a, a glimpse of our need of you, our desire for you, uh, build that up, cause the flame to, to rise up and to, to burst into a forest fire in our very hearts uh, so that we might know you, love you, and follow you, that we might truly delight in who you are, what you do, and what your purposes are. So now, Father, as we have this time together around tables, uh, build our um, friendship in Christ may, be, may it be sweet fellowship in the Lord Jesus as we sit with others whom 
uh, we know, love you, and we can grow together as you feed us. Thank you for your provision to us. Thank you for your graces and mercy. Bless this food to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.